Number 3. The Marcus Brothers Stuart and Cyril Marcus were born on June 2, 1930. Not much is known about their early lives, but the brothers were by all accounts intelligent men who both graduated with high honors from the New York University Upstate Medical Center. By the late 1950s, the brothers were both highly successful gynecologists who divided their time between working at New York Hospital Cornell as well as their own successful private practice. In 1960, Cyril divorced his wife and moved into his brother's upscale Manhattan apartment building. Shortly after that, Stuart broke up with his longtime girlfriend and the brothers began living together within the same building. In 1967, the brothers published a book titled Advances in Obstetrics and Gynecology, which was at that time regarded as one of the major textbooks within that field. By the time they had published their textbook, the brothers were already developing a reputation for bizarre behavior. One woman, who was briefly a patient of Stewart's, recalled this experience with him in 1966. On my third visit, he got angry about something. I no longer recall exactly what it was, and began to shout and scream at me. My husband was with me at the time, and I remember how, controlling an urge to respond in kind, he turned to me and said, let's go, this man is obviously crazy. Dr. Marcus seemed not to hear my husband's derogatory remark, though it was made sharply and loudly. He just went on ranting and raving, and we felt that although the doctor was standing just across the desk from us, it was if, in effect, he were somewhere else, somewhere very distant. We stood up and left. By the mid-1970s, the brothers had began abruptly cancelling appointments at their private practice and skipping shifts at the hospital. On several occasions, the hospital had to take administrative action in order to protect patients and the hospital from possible malpractice lawsuits. Things came to a head in June of 1975. A doctor at the New York hospital, who asked not to be named in the media, reported that one of the brothers had arrived to perform an operation in no condition to work. According to the doctor, the brother, he declined to say which one, was behaving so bizarrely that he was sent to the emergency ward for treatment. The other brother was called in, but he too was described as being out of it and was sent to the emergency ward as well. That same month, the brothers were informed that they would not be reappointed to the staff and that their tenure would cease at the beginning of July. On July 19th, after a week of tenants complaining about a foul smell coming from the brothers' apartment, police entered the unit to find both brothers deceased. The apartment was filled with rotting food and garbage, as well as many empty pill bottles. Initially, it was believed that both brothers had died due to withdrawal from barbiturates, but it was later discovered that Stewart had died of a barbiturate overdose sometime between July 10th and July 14th. Cyril had died between July 14th and July 17th. He had no drugs in his system, and his body showed no signs of the convulsions or brain hemorrhages that accompany narcotic withdrawal. His cause of death is listed as unknown. In 1988, filmmaker David Cronenberg wrote and directed the critically acclaimed film Dead Ringers, which is loosely based on the story of the Marcus Brothers. Number 2. The Erickson Sisters Ursula and Sabina Eriksson were born in Sweden on November 3, 1967. As with the Marcus brothers, not much is known about their early lives, but in light of later events, it is worth noting that neither had any history of mental health issues or exhibited any criminal behavior. By the year 2000, Ursula was living in the United States and Sabina was married with two children and living with her family in Ireland. In May of 2008, Ursula was visiting her sister in Ireland. On May 16th, Sabina reportedly had a fight with her husband, which resulted in the twins leaving Sabina's home and traveling to Liverpool, England. On May 18th, they visited a police station 
to report concerns over the safety of Sabina's children. Later that morning, they boarded a bus headed for London. At around 1 p.m., the driver of the bus kicked the twins off at a service station after becoming suspicious of their erratic behavior and because the twins refused to allow him to search their bags. The owner of the service station called police after becoming suspicious of the woman's behavior and police arrived and spoke to the sisters but left after deeming the women harmless. The pair then left the service station and began walking down the highway. At some point, the pair attempted to cross the busy highway, and Sabina sustained minor injuries after being struck by a car. In a later interview with the Swedish media, the twins' older brother claimed that they were attempting to cross the highway in order to get away from maniacs who were chasing them, but no eyewitness accounts support this story. Police quickly responded to the scene, and as they were speaking to the women on the side of the highway, and determining what course of action to take, Ursula suddenly broke free and ran out onto the road where she was sideswiped by a truck. Sabina followed her onto the road and was struck head on by a Volkswagen Polo. Both women survived the collisions, although Ursula's legs were badly injured and Sabina was knocked unconscious. Paramedics were called to the scene and began to treat Ursula who resisted by scratching and spitting at the aid workers and telling the policemen who were restraining her that she recognized them and knew that they were not real. Sabina regained consciousness at this point and told her sister that they were going to steal her organs. She managed to get to her feet, strike a policeman in the face, and run back out into traffic, but she was caught by emergency workers and several members of the public who carried her to an ambulance where she was handcuffed and sedated. Ursula, whose injuries were severe, was airlifted to a hospital, while Sabina was taken by ambulance to a different hospital. Sabina was treated for her injuries and soon became much calmer, although she showed no concern over the well-being of her sister. After five hours, she was released into police custody. While being processed, she told an officer we have a saying in Sweden that an accident rarely comes alone. Usually at least one more follows, maybe two. The next day, May 19th, Sabina was released from court after having pled guilty to the charges of trespass on the motorway and hitting a police officer. The court sentenced her to one day in custody, which she was deemed to have served, having spent the previous night in jail. After leaving court, Sabine began to wander the streets of Stoke-on-Trent, trying to locate her sister. At around 7 p.m., she encountered two local men, 54-year-old self-employed welder Glenn Hollingshead and his friend Peter Malloy, who were walking a dog. Sabina struck up a conversation with the men and appeared friendly, although her nervousness bothered Malloy. Sabina asked the two men for directions to any nearby hotels, Hollingshead offered to let her spend the night at his home, so the three went there. At the home, Sabina behaved oddly, constantly getting up to look out of the windows, leading Malloy to assume that she had run away from an abusive partner. She also offered the men cigarettes, only to quickly snatch them away, claiming they might be poisoned. Shortly before midnight, Malloy left. The next day, Hollingshead spent some time making phone calls to hospitals, trying to locate Ursula. At around 7.40 p.m., he began preparing dinner and went to his neighbor's home to ask for tea bags. After going back into his house, he staggered out of it a minute later, telling his neighbor, she stabbed me, before collapsing and quickly dying of his injuries. As the neighbor dialed emergency services, Sabina ran out of the house and down the street with a hammer, periodically hitting herself over the head with it. A passing motorist stopped his car and attempted to wrestle the hammer away from her, but Sabina managed to knock him unconscious with a piece of roofing tile she took out of her back pocket. By this time, paramedics had arrived and gave chase, which ended when she jumped off a 40-foot highway overpass, breaking both ankles and fracturing her skull. She was taken to the hospital. In September, Sabina was arrested and charged with murder after being released from the hospital. Ursula was also released from the hospital in September and made her way back to the United States. 
Sabina stood trial for murder one year later, in September of 2009. She eventually pled guilty to a charge of manslaughter with diminished responsibility. At no point during her trial did she attempt to explain her actions. Her defense claimed that the twins had been suffering from folly a deux, a rare psychological condition where the delusions of one person are passed on to another. In this case, it was claimed that Ursula was the primary sufferer who passed her delusions on to Sabina. She was sentenced to five years in prison, and having already spent over a year in custody awaiting trial, was paroled in 2011. Many people were angry at the short length of her sentence. In a media interview, Glenn Hollingshead's brother directed most of his anger toward the criminal justice system, stating, We don't hold her responsible, the same as we wouldn't blame a rabid dog for biting someone. She is ill, and to a large degree, not responsible for her actions, but her mental disorder should have been recognized much earlier. I question the criminal justice system for allowing somebody like this to be let out when she is capable of committing such a crime. Her mental condition should have been properly assessed after what she did on the motorway and the experiences the police had. Her mental disorder should have been picked up prior to her being let out into the community. As of the time of this video, it is believed that Ursula is still living in the United States and Sabina's last known whereabouts were in Norway. Reportedly, the twins still keep in touch. Number 1. The Gibbons Sisters June and Jennifer Gibbons were born on April 11, 1963. Their father, Aubrey, was a Caribbean immigrant to the United Kingdom who worked as a technician for the Royal Air Force. The twins were born in Yemen when their father was stationed there, but soon the family moved back to the UK, settling in Harverford West, Wales. Like the Marcus brothers, the twins displayed high intelligence. However, their experiences at school were not pleasant, as they were bullied for both their race and their unusual behavior, which included speaking to each other in their own language, a hybrid of Bajan Creole and English, and walking in unison so that their strides were perfectly synchronized. Eventually, the twins would speak only to each other and to their younger sister, Rose. By the time they were 14, the pair were unsuccessfully treated by several therapists in an attempt to break their isolation. As nothing seemed to be working, it was decided to try and send the twins to separate boarding schools. However, this backfired as the sisters both became catatonic when separated, when they were reunited, they resumed their isolation. In 1979, their parents gave them diaries as gifts, and both twins immediately took to writing. After sending away for a mail-order course in creative writing, both began to write both short stories and novels, some of which they had self-published. In June's novel, The Pepsi-Cola Addict, a boy in high school is seduced by his teacher and ends up being sent to a reformatory where he must fend off the advances of a male guard. In Jennifer's novel, The Pugilist, a doctor is so eager to save his child's life that he kills the family dog to obtain its heart for transplant, but the spirit of the dog lives on inside the child and eventually seeks its revenge on the doctor. Some of the twins' diary entries reveal that despite their extreme bond and mutual dependence, their relationship was not always positive. As June was born 10 minutes before Jennifer, Jennifer saw her as older, smarter, prettier, and funnier. June sensed her jealousy and wrote in her diary, She wants us to be equal. There is a murderous gleam in her eye. Dear Lord, I am scared of her. She is not normal. Someone is driving her insane. It is me. Jennifer wrote, We have become fatal enemies in each other's eyes. We feel the irritating deadly rays come out of our bodies, stinging each other's skin. I say to myself, can I get rid of my own shadow? Impossible or not possible. Without my shadow, would I die? Without my shadow, would I gain life, be free, or left to die? Without my shadow, which I identify with a face of misery, deception, murder. On one occasion, Jennifer tried to strangle June with an electric cord, and on another occasion, 
June threw Jennifer into a river in an attempt to drown her. At one point, the twins even attempted suicide. As the sisters continued to mature, they, like many teens, began experimenting with drugs and alcohol. Shortly after this, they began exhibiting criminal behavior, progressing from theft and vandalism to more serious crimes like arson, the pair eventually wound up in front of a judge. Rather than being sentenced to jail, they were admitted to Broadmoor Hospital, a high-security mental institution near London, for the criminally insane. They would remain there for 11 years. Placed on high doses of antipsychotic medication, the pair lost most of their interest in creative writing at this time. Attempts by staff psychologists to treat them proved unsuccessful as the twins continued to refuse to speak to anyone but each other. In 1985, they were visited at the hospital by a woman named Marjorie Wallace, a writer who hoped to write a book about the twins. Marjorie eventually became one of the only other people that the twins would speak to, and after her book, the Silent Twins was published in 1986, she continued to make regular visits to the sisters. According to Marjorie, the twins revealed to her that they had a long-standing agreement that if one of them were to die, the other would have to begin to speak normally and live a normal life. Eventually, they decided that one of them would have to sacrifice her life so that the other could live. In 1993, as the twins were nearing their 30th birthdays, Jennifer casually told Marjorie that she was going to have to die. When asked why, she said simply, because we decided. Later that same year, the sisters were transferred from Broadmoor to a lower security facility in Wales. Upon arrival to the institution, Jennifer became unresponsive. She was taken to a hospital and died shortly afterwards of myocarditis, a sudden inflammation of the heart. No drugs or poison were found in her system, and she did not have any pre-existing heart conditions. The cause of her sudden death remains unexplained. June was released from the institution one year later in 1994. While she never became a very outgoing person, she lives a much more normal life now. As of the time of this video, she reportedly lives alone in a small town in Wales, close to her parents. She is accepted by the community and occasionally does odd jobs around town, although she rarely socializes. To the surprise of many, she has never attempted to pursue her writing career, reportedly saying that as she can talk normally now, she has no need to write. Thanks so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, subscribe and check out my other videos for more videos just like this. Thanks for watching.